All right. Hey there. Welcome to uh, the third in our series of eight blog and live Q&A sessions. My name is Matt Bobman, and I'm glad you're here. Before we get into questions, I want to take a second and remind everyone that our past live Q&As are up at the blog site, along with the two great posts. Uh, Harjeev and Meredith also put together a really great infographic on practical aspects of uh, basics of motor learning. And I'd love for you guys to check that out if you haven't already. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that we have an eight hour online course featuring Claire Ardern, Rich Willie and Dustin Grooms, we're calling that home sessions. You can find that at our site, uh, as well as registration for the upcoming evidence practice ACL course on May 22nd. That's a comprehensive ACL rehab course and it's set up as a pay what you can price because I know some people are still hurting from pandemic restrictions. Tonight, I'm really lucky to be moderating this Q&A for Dave Sherman. Uh, Dave is studying at the University of Toledo Motion Analysis and Integrative Neurophysiology Lab. And I'm really excited to be talking to Dave. So Dave, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, so Dave, uh, before we get into questions, can you tell, uh, tell me a little bit about your clinical and research backgrounds? Sure, yeah. So I'm a physical therapist and athletic trainer. I graduated from Boston University uh, in 2012 and 14, 14 with the DPT. And then um, my wife, who's also an athletic trainer, physical therapist, got a job working at Ben Hogan Sports Medicine, their sports and PT residency. So that's where we moved. Uh, we both worked there for about four years in clinical practice, uh, treating the majority of my caseload uh, was ACL reconstructed patients, or patients with ACL reconstruction. Um, and back in school, I had always kind of been curious about the PhD route, uh, passion for teaching, passion for research. And the questions, uh, or my inability, I should say, to to get my patients better back to the way they were before their injury uh, kept nagging at me. Uh, so I returned to school in 2018, uh, studying now with Grant Norte at the University of Toledo. And so here we try to answer the questions that, um, that were covered in the blog, everything from uh, what an athlete encounters that leads to an injury uh, to what they have to overcome to recover from that injury and improve um, our treatments in order to ultimately improve quality of life uh, and avoid secondary or post-operative sequelae in the long term. Excellent. Well, it was, it was a really great blog post. Uh, it, was, it was a big blog post. It had like yeah. tons of different uh, aspects. And so I, uh, yeah. I'm probably not the only one who had to read it multiple times. Uh, which I think is is really is really Sorry. great. I mean, you covered a ton of stuff. <laughs> um, so I think before we get into questions, I, I had a few uh, I have a few uh, definitions. I'm hoping you can start us off with, uh, and I sure. think that will help uh, <laughs> readers of the blog understand a little bit better. So uh, first one: Can you define attention? What is attention? Oh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Harjeev tried to answer this, and um, he did a great job. So nobody knows what attention is. Um, at least not from a neuro, neurophysiological perspective. Um, but I think of it as our ability to selectively um, focus or uh, concentrate on things that are important or perceived to be important for our motor plan or from our environment. Uh, and, and the other side of the coin is to ignore um, things that, were, that are not important to be intended or attending to. Yeah, when you say you don't know from a neurophysiology perspective, what, like, do you mean like what, you don't know the the actual mechanisms of attention in, in the brain? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's part of it, and and it's an it's a umbrella term that's uh, used to refer to many different phenomena, uh, even in behavior as well. Uh, you have okay. focused attention, divided attention. I mean, you think there's there's an infinite list of any word in front of attention, and you can define it however you'd like. Okay. Uh, from a research perspective, it makes it difficult to study and uh, frustrating to talk about. Okay. All right. Excellent. I'm going to ask everybody from here on out. There, we still have four more of these. So, yeah. Yeah. We have five more of these. Um, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what everyone says. Uh, so then, another uh, another thing I'd like to, to define: what is embodiment, and what is embodied? What is an embodied sensory motor system? What is that? 
Sure. Um, so embodiment just basically, it, it alludes to embodied cognition, which is this way of thinking about um, cognition and the way that we think is actually, um, it, it, it requires movement or to be attached to something. So we think basically through movement, uh, if you will, or through motor actions. Um, so our embodied sensory motor system just implies that feedback loop. If we're going to perceive something, uh, that uh, perception will inform motor plan, and then the subsequent motor action will change the perception of the environment. Okay. And um, so that, I guess, uh, maybe a follow-up question is that, should should PTs be philosopher? I mean, is this a philosophical concept or, or uh how should how should we how should we think about this? Yeah, I mean, um, we sh we should think about this. Our patients, our patients are, are are humans. They need to they need to navigate the world, navigate the environment. They've lost the ability to do something. That's why they come to see a physical therapist or an athletic trainer or another rehab professional. And they're counting on us to restore their ability to function. Um, now that function implies that they're going to be moving about in the world uh, and they need to perceive the environment and and uh, enact a motor plan on that environment in order to achieve function. So we don't need to think about the limits of cognition and um, how exactly the sensory motor system um, is computing these things or encoding the environment, but we should think of it as a way or from the perspective of our patients sensory motor system and cognitive system needs to be able to handle uh, these stimuli in order to behave um, normally or within their level of function. Okay. Um, well, how does this, how do you reconcile the ecological approach with the CNS information processing approach? They seem opposite ends of the spectrum. And also, that, that's not my question. That question came in. So what is, what is the ecological approach? Can you define that and then, and then answer the question? Yeah, so I think uh, whoever submitted this question must be reading my dissertation documents because um, this, is a, this is a frame that I had uh, commented for myself in my writing of a, of a literature review. Um, the boiled down version of that is the blog that you've all seen. Um, and and the ecological approach basically means, or it's an extension of this embodied approach. So it's discussing um, behavior from the, the 10,000 foot view, the systems or the um, uh, ecologies that, that influence behavior or influence um, beings in, in the world. That could be animals or plants or, or whatever. Um, and then the, the sensory motor system from the neurophysiological perspective is, is more of the inside out approach. Um, and so the ecological approach is really the, the here you are, you're, you're plopping an organism into an environment and they're going to interact with it. Um, the inside out approach of the sensory motor system, the way that I view it is how is that environment interacting with the organism? And then how is the organism then interacting with the environment? In, in the case of injury, this, this pattern of input and output from the sensory motor perspective, um, you know, it's my contention that it's changed or disrupted. Uh, and so that changes everything. It changes how the organism perceives the environment and thus how they're able to enact the motor plan. Yeah, I think something really stuck with me in your uh, in your post, which is that the knee uh, in ACL and the surrounding structures constitutes the largest sense organ in the body. That was that's news to me. That's really huge. And to think that that is like, um, you know, disruption of, of the largest sense organ in the body, you're going to have a lot of uh, altered uh, input and which I guess in turn affects the output and, and lots of sure. other things as well. I will say that's not entirely truthful from a uh, degree of nerve density standpoint. Those would be probably okay. your eyes. Uh, but from a volume <laughs> standpoint, the knee is the largest joint and joints are sensory organs. And so there you have it, the largest sensory organ in the body. Okay, good. I, I've been telling everybody that. So I, it yeah. must, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so when you, so you got a patient sitting in front of you 
um, you know, they, they just had this surgery. Like what's going through your mind? How do you start getting these athletes ready for interpersonal dynamics? Like how are you envisioning um, their, you know, how they're interacting with, uh, with the world and, and how are you trying to set them up to do it well? Um, yeah, so to, to be honest, I, I don't think about this stuff right away. This is a means to an end. Um, when you're interacting with a patient, you're interacting with a person. You're not interacting with, with nerves and muscles. Uh, so you first have to understand who that person is and, and what factors are going to influence their recovery and what their goals are for recovery, right? I often think about, uh, you know, my, my two o'clock appointment is a high school soccer player with a, with an ACL injury. And my three o'clock appointment is a 30 year old mom who has knee osteoarthritis after her ACL surgery 15 years ago. Uh, now she's plays with her kids and can't cause her, cause her knee hurts. And so is my 15 year old high school soccer athlete who's in the days and weeks following their surgery going to become uh, this uh, adult with disability and the, the answer is likely yes. And although the athlete's goals in that, in that time are not, are not, I want to be not disabled when I'm an adult, they are, I want to play soccer in a few months. Um, we have to, we have to reconcile our treatments in order to achieve kind of both aims and, and look out for the, the best interests of the patients in both the short and the long term. And in, in clinical practice, my frustration was I'm not able to achieve this, no matter how hard I try, or how intense um, the treatments are, how, how evidence-based I'm applying uh, care. It never seemed to work to, to the extent that I was hoping. Uh, that's uh, impairments in knee range of motion because scar tissue buildup or, or muscle inhibition that's chronic lasting five to six to nine months. Uh, re-injuries, like multiple athletes discharge past our rigorous return to sport criteria. And then next year I see them, they're a year older and have another injury. And so that's frustrating. And that's why I <laughs> gave up. I'm going to go study this and, uh, <laughs> here, here we are. So, yeah. um, what I, what I've learned since then is I think this is the kind of the essence of the, the complexity um, angle of this blog is all of these factors, uh, it's the job of the clinician to consider this stuff and weigh in on it and apply it in, in a way that, uh, that is both patient focused and evidence based and overcomes the unlimited barriers um, that, that face both the clinician, right, as a person themselves having to go to work for 40 hours a week, manage 50 different individuals on their caseload, um, you know, short lunch break, not a lot, enough vacation time, documentation load, all that stuff, right? And then you got the patient themselves with their goals and, um, you know, where does all the neuroscience have time to fit in? Um, so I, this, this blog hopefully kind of opens or at least opens up the opportunity to have that conversation of where a, where a researcher and clinician partnership can kind of fill the void, um, disseminate some of the great evidence that we have now, the great techniques that I think are, are underutilized probably in clinical practice, and discuss about the future of, you know, and really chart the course for what this rehab will look like over the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, a couple of things you said just stuck with me. And I think one of them is the, you know, the patient where you, you do your best and they come back and they've got enough, they've got an injury, a re-injury. Uh, and it's just like, it's just a gut punch, I think for me at least. Uh, and I can, I can picture one, one young guy, uh, who I, uh, I think I did pretty well with him, uh, ACL and, uh, he, uh, he went back and then I, I remember seeing him crunch, crutch into the clinic, uh, having torn his other ACL. And I was just like, a, like that really sucks for me. I, I mean, I can only imagine it's 10 times worse right. for the person who has to go through it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, uh, so you mentioned frustration. It's really nice to know, like I'm a clinician. I'm very frustrated often, uh, most, you know, for, for similar reasons, you know, lots of reasons, but, um, uh, you know, 
you know, you think like, what am I not doing? What am I missing? What, what, yeah. you know, trying to practice, um, you know, to the best of my ability and we're still not good enough in a lot of ways. Um, so at least you're doing something about it. You're, I'm just, I'm just, uh, um, sometimes I don't feel like that, but <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, can't do it yeah. all, I suppose, but, um, you, and I guess you have you know, job. Uh, yeah, you're not the, you're not the first person to tell me that. Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, and then I guess another thing that you said is, is like, uh, you know, underutilized, uh, treatments. And I think that, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, doing the basics well, uh, does go a long ways. There's still people not doing the basics well. And right. so I'd like to see more of, of just the, that stuff being done. Um, so yeah, let's see here. And, and yeah, and with that comes, um, the answer to that question for me was this sensory motor system insult and understanding, uh, you know, our primary focus as clinicians with this ACL problem is, is the quadriceps, right? It all boils down really to this muscle weakness that impairs movement patterns and leads to knee joint disability in the long term. That's we're narrow, so narrowly focused on that, both as researchers and clinicians, it seems from where I'm standing. And the quadriceps is not injured, right? It's it's the ligament in the knee that's injured and the muscle, as Lindsay the step note said a few weeks ago, um, is sick. Right? Lindsay Lepley. Oh sorry, Lindsay Lepley. Oh sorry, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lepley. Oh no, sorry. That's yeah. okay, she's not watching. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, she might be. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you're right. That was that stuck with me too, and it was probably you who commented. It was a guy, Dave, who commented that you know using the the analogy of a sick muscle is really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, was it was it you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, was, that yeah. stuck with me too. That stuck with me and too. So, um, and so the the, the the catalyst there is the ligament injury, and and then mm -hmm. that makes the muscle sick. And there's interventions that that we have to treat this arthrogenic muscle inhibition. It's called AMI. And these interventions need to be applied with the time course or within the, the time frame of neurophysiological impairments after injury. And so we wrote about TENS and uh, focal joint cooling in the blog. We wrote about eccentric exercise and a few other techniques that um, really clinicians, there's, there's strong evidence that clinicians should adopt these now uh, in order yeah. to improve this muscle function. And they're not new. They're not like they're cutting edge no. technologies, right? Come on. Yeah. And widely available, um, which, which, which makes them useful. It's not yeah. like some, yeah. I don't know, expensive piece of equipment. Right. Totally. Uh, well, I'm going to ask you another question about inter, uh, interpersonal cool. dynamics. Uh, so, so you note in the blog that it wasn't, it's not been studied in ACL. Uh, populations, but are there other musculoskeletal populations that have been studied that you can use to extrapolate? That's a good question. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure. My my review of the literature has focused mostly on just healthy, um, really sport analytics. Um, and so what constitutes interpersonal dynamics in soccer, for example, is the cited um, article in my reading list. And it's this is the ecological approach or the the embodied approach to the way I think in that biomechanics is again we're singularly focused on this as being the um, cause of an ACL injury and this is the mechanism of an ACL injury knee, knee valgus collapse or uh, femoral adduction internal rotation those mechanistically cause ACL rupture uh, but they may not be um, the cause of the biomechanical fault, right? So the, the biomechanical fault doesn't happen um, in isolation. It happens when somebody's running to avoid a defender or running change in direction based on what's mm -hmm. happening around them in their environment. Now, so that that makes me think of a, a quote that, that was in your post about uh, uh, that says, "Could natural biomechanical variability be the scapegoat of wider systems failure?" So, are you saying? Uh, um, well, <laughs> let me ask. You, can you explain that quote? Yeah, sure. So it it's just saying that in isolation, uh, you know, knee valgus 
doesn't rupture ACLs. I can stand here and push my knee as far into valgus as I want or internally mm -hmm. rotate my femur. There's speed that has to happen with it and these biomechanical faults, they don't happen in isolation, right? It's not like, um, there is some actually great literature, I can't remember the last name, but um, where they take cadaveric knees and they put them in these devices and, and twist them until the ACL ruptures. And sure enough, we know exactly what mm -hmm. ruptures the ACL. Um, but biomechanical variability is actually healthy. If I reach for the glass of water on my table, I'm not gonna reach for it the same way twice, whether that's mm -hmm. the joint angle coordination I have, the degree to which I open my fingers, where I actually grasp the glass, how I bring it to my mouth, et cetera. All those things are, are going to be different every single time. And so when we bring an athlete into a lab or in the clinic and we have them do a drop jump landing, um, it, it doesn't mean that it's gonna translate and they're gonna perform it the same way on the field. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of call for more in study of interpersonal dynamics is both from a um, injury incident standpoint, what can, what can we do to predict this or try to control this or at least prepare patients for this, as well as rehab standpoint of recreating environments um, that, that cause an individual to navigate this, these types of environments before we release them onto the field. Okay. So, I, uh, I, th I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So biomechanics in that way is, is a is the scapegoat it is a necessary component but it's not sufficient it's in isolation it, it rarely ever happens um mm. to somebody who's just walking down the street yeah right? i, th I think the article you never happen i've i've had patients that fall or, or slip on the sidewalk and tear the gray cl but um yeah with, with the people or the folks we're talking about here i feel like are more high velocity random injuries of, of otherwise healthy people who are prepared for sport. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the article you're uh, referencing is Koga in 2010. I believe so. Sure, um, yeah. And I wonder, uh, I wonder if there would be, are, are, is this sort of uh, what you just said, is this in, con maybe not contradiction, but maybe uh, a little bit opposite of, of what some other researchers out there might be uh, talking about or teaching or preaching? I mean, would you, could you get a robust uh, maybe debate <laughs> going with, of course with uh, can, a researcher yeah. or two out there? Yeah. Okay. Of, of course you can. I mean, I don't think um, I don't think this is a favorable opinion, and it, of course, it's a dis you can disagree with it. Um, yeah. But I, you know, we've all seen videos of of ACL injuries in that happen in sport, right? Whether it's on the football game on Sunday night or home video of your kid playing soccer or football. And if you can say it happened just because of their biomechanics, their, their knee collapse, um, tell me why it collapsed, right? That's, that's the argument for, from this standpoint, the ACL ruptured because the knee collapsed. Yes. But, but why did the knee collapse in that instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. I think it's great. Um, so Steph Allen asks, uh, do you believe that perhaps earlier transition to including on-field or court sessions could help mitigate some of the negative CNS changes? Um, yes, I, I feel like it does. Um, so this is a area of really cool research that's uh, really the possibilities are endless with, with virtual reality training or um, there's some evidence already in motor imagery uh, and how this actually improves um, muscle activation or motor cortex excitability. So the ability for your motor cortex to actually send a signal that activates the, the quadriceps muscle in the limb, um, that threshold gets lower with things like motor imagery training or motor practice and motor skill learning. And so getting patients out of this clinical setting of the three sets of 10 um, I, I believe would absolutely facilitate uh, not only for that reason, but also um, what it does for their psychological well-being, right? If that's their goal, they want to get back on a basketball court, why not let them do that as soon as it's, it's feasibly safe? Even if it's that, that's just the environment that they're doing their, their therapeutic exercise in. 
um, that kind of empowerment and, and self-efficacy and um, and really enhanced expectancies as we call as they call it in motor learning, it it, it would have confounding effects. Um, now there's no studies that study these things or studies do review these things in isolation from a neurophysiological standpoint, but the, but the confounding effects of adding everything in together or wherever in rehab, um, you know, there's there's no good grasp on that. That's where the art of clinical practice comes in of you do it best for the patient, you apply um, what you can to achieve the patient's goals, but thinking about that underlying neurophysiology of, okay, we know motor imagery, we know motor skills training, uh, potentially improving self-efficacy improves motor cortex excitability, then maybe that'll be, that'll show some translation into their quadricep strength over time in the clinic. I heard a um, I heard a recent uh, uh, pod was a podcast and they were talking about VR and they were mentioning uh, that the sort of the fidelity of the VR has to be high for for yeah. better better carryover. Are you familiar with uh, the research and with respect to that, like the I've I've talked uh, about designing research studies with VR. Uh, we have a a very nice. Um, uh, center here uh, at the University of Toledo that has state-of-the-art virtual reality equipment. They use it for um, training physicians in surgeries and uh, our athletic training students use it uh, as well. And the, the engineers of the VR systems, um, they mentioned that, that it's hard to believe uh, you're in, you're fully immersed in a real environment when you're looking at cartoon people. So, <laughs> Um, the, the high fidelity means it needs to feel real, right? It, and yeah, that's why uh, you have to have a patient engaged. But early on in rehab, when a patient has very high levels of disability, they can't walk down the street without a limp. These things are, are probably more engaging than they would be near the end of rehab when they actually can do the task themselves more wholly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where all the exciting work now at the at Spark. Um, I think that Jason will probably talk about in a few weeks um, yeah. with the augmented reality capabilities that they have and they're developing. That, that stuff's really cool. Um, it's like an overlay of, of on the real world, basically. Um, mm -hmm. so there's, some, there's some really cool potential there. Yeah. Um, right. So I'm trying not to make a Ready Player One reference here. I don't know if you've <laughs> seen around the book. I understand it, so please don't. It's a, okay, good. Well, it's it's all about <laughs> virtual. It's about virtual reality. It's a very nerdy book. Uh, not usual. Not my usual book, but it was it was pretty entertaining. Uh, okay. um, all right. Um, okay, so let me ask you about uh, deafferentation. So you know, based on your blog post, I was trying to make sense of this. So it actually sounds like deafferents after an ACL injury is a good adaptation uh, because you note that those with um, preserved afferents are more likely to become non-copers. Like, what's the clinical significance of this? Yeah, this is from uh, studies by Courtney et al. Um, they're probably 10, 15 years old, I think 2008, around there. Um, so in, in her research, she's studying the, af the afferent volley of the sensory signal to the spinal cord in the brain. Um, and those with, with no input, they tend to have higher spinal reflexive excitability of the hamstrings. So the hamstrings are actually facilitated to provide this active stabilization of the knee. And those that have preserved input, um, theoretically, with, with no mechanical tension, the sensory system still waiting to kind of send a signal of, hey, the ACL got stretched, but the ACL, that signal will never fire because the ACL is not there. The hamstrings don't upregulate. And so there's no more mechanical or active stability to, to counteract that loss of passive stability. So long story short, no, no input to the brain, the spinal level loop uh, increases hamstring flexibility and therefore, or sorry, increases ham hamstring excitability and therefore dynamic knee stability. 
but we're, we don't measure this currently in clinical practice that I'm aware of. And we and very infrequently are patients um, uh, seen before surgery or in my experience, um, even questioned about being copers or non-copers and given the opportunity to go non, non-operative. And so we don't, we don't know the clinical implications of this because I would say the majority of these folks, whether they're on the diaphragm side or the um, you know, normal afferent side, copers or non-copers, they end up with ACL reconstruction more often than not. Uh, and then we're not trained as clinicians. And to be honest, in my, in my view, there's no good um, clinical sign to, to determine this right now. Um, but this is the opportunity um, to intervene early on after surgery. The same spinal level circuits are impaired in a way that impairs quadriceps muscle function. And these treatments like TENS and focal joint cooling do target this sensory loop in order to improve or normalize muscle function uh, during therapeutic treatment windows that, that we can maximize treatments during. But that's probably what maybe. Doing, yeah. So. <laughs> um. Maybe, maybe can you, uh, so you mentioned TENS and focal joint cooling. Could you, could you expand a little bit more on those mechanisms? Uh, and then also maybe talk about um, uh, the difference between how you would use a TENS unit and an MES unit, uh, and, you know, early on in rehab to, to help facilitate re return to um, function. Yeah, so um, we cited the Rice paper for, for this and my uh, PhD advisor just led the charge on updating a, a new kind of review of the, the disinhibitory modalities like TENS and focal joint cooling. And, um, and so hopefully that's, uh, you know, submitted and published soon. Uh, but this all this stuff is fresh on my mind. So the mechanisms of TENS uh, are the same that you understand them for when you're using it to mask, uh, to mask pain. Uh, these stimulate sensory nerve endings. They go into the spinal cord. And um, in that way, they can kind of mask the sensory signals uh, that, that are caused by the effusion or the loss of the ACL injury uh, that, that result in muscle inhibition. So you kind of normalize or, or kind of gate control, if you will, that in, those inhibitory signals. And then you kind of reduce the level of inhibition of the quadriceps on the motor side of things. So the key importance there is you're using the sensory system to modulate spinal level excitability and improve motor output. And focal joint cooling works the same way. You're, you're using the sensory system, you're numbing sensory nerves, which would be applying ice to the joint itself, not to the muscle or anything like that, to the joint itself prior to exercise. That again, disinhibits the spinal level um, neurons that go to the quadriceps muscle. So TENS would be applied before exercise or during exercise. So about 20 minutes of treatment uh, before or throughout an exercise. Um, and these are, and then focal joint cooling would be applied for about 20 minutes before you start exercising uh, and doing quadriceps like neuromuscular re-education or quadriceps strengthening. And these are really indicated uh, only in the acute or subacute phases of of rehab. So right after the injury itself, when the knee is swollen, or there's like, um, you know, biological processes going on, and then right after surgery itself, until, uh, you know, for that first month or month and a half or two months where there's still some swelling or uh, that quadriceps inhibition is really uh, prominent. On the other side is, is NMES. And NMES, a lot of people use like NMES. There's some good evidence that shows that it, it helps improve quadriceps strength, um, but that's not targeting the, the inhibition of the muscle. NMES is augmenting a muscle contraction by directly stimulating the motor neur neuron at the, at the level of when it, it, where it innervates the muscle itself. And so it's not treating the nervous system or the underlying problem. It's treating the symptom, which is the, the poor ability to contract the muscle. Um, treatments like focal joint cooling and TENS treat the cause of the problem, which would be the sensory uh, deafferents or sensory alterations that inhibit the muscle itself. And so the, those three interventions all achieve the same goal, stronger muscle contractions, 
um, but the, the disinhibitory interventions uh, potentially are treating or, or achieving that effect through unmasking volitional control of neurons, uh, which is, in my view, more beneficial than artificially contracting the muscle. So what's the, um, what's the, uh, I don't know what the right word is, refractory period, or how long, how long do you have after you have a, you have an effective TENS treatment? Uh, are you, are you, uh, do you have some, uh, are you improving disinhibition for an hour, two hours, 24 hours after treatment? Yeah, so good question. TENS is about 45 minutes, uh, the effects will last. And uh, focal joint cooling, probably 30 to 45 minutes, just as, until the tissue is rewarmed. So it gives you a therapeutic window if you're, you know, your patients they come into the therapy, you can set them up on this, uh, you know, instead of the bike, maybe, if they're really early on after surgery. And utilize these during your, your quadricep exercises and then uh, go on to, you know, the other you know, shoot the other exercises that you do during, during therapy. Um, could they, sure. Could they keep the tens on? I mean, could they just like uh, oh, start absolutely. it in the morning and yeah. Tens, okay. tens could be applied. Um, yeah. So if you have low back pain, some uh, folks will still recommend that you wear tens all day long. Uh, it's not going to be harmful. Um, it might be irritating. I don't personally like the feeling, but um, <laughs> It, it is, it does create, I think, as a clinician, I was familiar with these therapeutic treatment windows. If you use like thermal ultrasound and stuff, you get like five minutes of tissue elongation or something, right? Um, so TENS and focal joint cooling is, is more like 30 to 45 minutes. And, the, and that's a really effective time window with a with pretty significant ability to affect change with a disinhibited quadriceps muscle. Interesting. That's great. I, uh, I learned something new. Uh, I learned a lot of new things. Um, so I, uh, I, someone asked a question uh, about giving a, uh, an athlete a false sense of confidence. I mean, does that, is that a, is that a factor in, um, you know, dis, uh, working on disinhibition? Are we going to, are we going to puff them up too much, make them bold? No, I mean, I, I don't think so. I, I think, uh, again, you're, you're treating, you're using this, this treatment when, um, there's, there's an active kind of metabolic process going on in the knee or they're still recovering, um, like function. And so you're, I don't think it's indicated to have tens on while somebody's out shooting basketballs or doing their return to sport progression or anything like that. They graduate out of this, this treatment. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't worry too much about building dependency on a treatment like this. Okay. Uh, let's, I, here's a question about a relevant movement test. So given after reading your blog, it, it seems a little silly to think that a hop test is going to capture all, uh, all the information that we're hoping for. What is, what do you like for movement tests? What, what gives you information that you're actually, you know, can use? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I was thinking about it and so Dusty Grooms has some publications in his group on these neurocognitive hop tests that just add a little bit of decision making um, to already common tests, which I think is a, is a great start. We even our lab played around with some agility based tasks uh, using fit light systems or blaze pods or, um, you know, some other type of reactive agility test. Um, and in trying to develop a you know, gold standard for for that, like 90 limb, 90 percent limb symmetry index, or um, some some measure of height that we use for for hot testing, uh, but instead like an agility based or reaction time assessment. Um, but ultimately, what what I'm really excited about, one of our master students is developing a, a collision avoidance task that actually pits uh, two athletes against one another in an agility paradigm where they need to make decisions uh, at according to the other person's behavior. And that's really where we get into sport when we talk about somebody interacting in a dyad or in a small group. And where the environment becomes somebody else's behavior, which is not something we, we currently do commonly in the clinic, or at least not in an objective way. So there's of course drills where you'll jump in and try to disrupt an athlete's pattern, but not in an objective way for return to sport testing. 
And so the, the current recommendation that I have along these lines would be to use a, a progressive return to play protocol. So that's after they pass all the battery of tests that they have um, for you to feel comfortable, like, okay, this is the, the standard of care. They've, they've convinced me they've passed the return to sport test battery that they can go back and play. To me, in my practice, that was the, okay, you've entered the next stage. Now it's six weeks before you're kind of six to eight weeks before you're cleared full go on field. Now you can start practicing. Here's your level of, of drills. Uh, then you kind of increase the chaos and involvement from there to get them to get them ready to go. And there was just a, a great paper. Uh, I think Matt Tavener was on it um, for, uh, for the controlled chaos continuum. So along along those lines where it, it happens more in the in the clearance and transition to the play phase than it does in the clinic. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. Um, let's see here. Are there ways that we can quantify and test neural efficiency in the clinic? And how can we leverage that information in our treatments? I like this question too. Um, I, I don't know if I'm the person to answer this question, to be honest. I think um, like Dusty Grooms and Meredith, Shapu uh, mm -hmm. probably have better grasp on neurocognition and neuroefficiency than I do. Um, but I can say from an EEG perspective, we can look at the um, basically the processing delays of somebody, so when they see a stimulus to when they actually react or, or choose a motor plan. Um, and this kind of type of neural efficiency or it's like decision-making quickness could be screened in the clinic with a like a clinical reaction time test. Uh, that's that's a standardized test where you basically drop like a, a ruler or yardstick with a hockey puck tied to the end and see how fast they can actually grab it. Um, or any other like neurocognitive tests or paradigms that are layered onto our normal movements or exercises, like a, think of a jump landing task where they're, or a cutting task where they're counting down serial sevens or, or things like that. And I think when in doubt, just, just quizzing your patients with uh, neurocognition uh, or drilling yeah. them with these neurocognitive components can help with that neural efficiency. Again, that neural efficiency is the ability to process more information from the environment um, than than any other person, right? Yeah, like uh, filling up filling up bandwidth, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Filling up your bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. Don't you love it? Do you ever get a patient where you 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 think you're gonna you're you're gonna get some breakdown in technique, or they're gonna really stumble, and then they do like uh, like the months backwards, starting with December, and it's just like they just run right through, and you're like, okay, yeah. I don't know why you did that so quick. I <laughs> I can't even stand still and do that one. Um, and they move, and they moved better to boot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think you probably answer. just successfully distracted them from, uh, you know, maybe thinking about the movement too much. Yeah. Maybe there you, you go. Gave them something else, and the movement was more natural. That's right. We sort of let them fall into their uh, their well established motor patterns that they they've done a thousand times before. Um, well, how would you measure psychological, social, and contextual factors, and how might that change your treatment plan with an ACL patient? We know that these, you know, you expanded on this a little bit. You pointed to uh, Linda's uh, really great review yeah. uh, on your reading yeah, I list. Gotta, I got to say, if that, I, uh, I would say that if that paper had come out when I was in clinical practice, that would have been the most impactful thing on my, on my care or practice uh, probably yeah. ever. I mean, that, that paper uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had overlooked. Um, and of course, we're trained to use these, uh, you know, psychosocial outcome measures like the ACL RSI, or, uh, which is a readiness for sport index uh, that measures fear, or fear of re-injury, and then we have kinesiophobia measures. Um, but those are just dealing with, with fear. And they're dealing, doing so in kind of an impersonal way, I would say. Just give your, your, the individual in front of you a survey. And so I think the, way, the, the appropriate way to balance this from a clinical perspective is what you all do so well, and that's treat the person in front of you, right? Have a conversation with them, know what's going on in their lives, 
who they are, what their goals are, what their barriers, what their motivations are, and, and really designing a, a custom treatment approach that suits that and um, that inspires them and, and, and deconstructs barriers where appropriate. I mean, every person you see is going to be different than the first than the last one you saw or the next one you will see. And, and that's where this stuff comes in and really, really hits home for me. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the extent of my advice there for, it's basically the world, but you know, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just treating them like a, like a person is, is a good starting point. It's a good foundation. Yeah. And I, and I can't see how that would um, make their experience any worse or your experience mm -hmm. as the treating clinician any worse. Uh, in fact, I can only see how it would improve uh, their experience and, and probably their outcomes, right? Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that, that people do this already, right? And, and this is being done very well by clinicians all over the globe, um, but mm -hmm. it's something to think about if you're not thinking about it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think there's there's a lot of clinicians out there who never never pick up a single research article, uh, but they're just really good with people and they're sure. still pretty good clinicians for that. Yeah. And if and I'll nerd out just a little bit on, um, you know, the neuro side of this and that's, uh, things like learned helplessness or, um, uh, low self-efficacy do impair motor behavior, right? They're, uh, the individual yeah. is kind of more withdrawn or more dependent on like maybe, maybe passive treatment or not confidence in the, confident in their ability to move or function. And that's going to influence, directly influence the actual motor activity coming out of their brain down to the muscle. And so something to think about yeah. from, a, from an outcome standpoint. Yeah, and I think that this is, uh, this is a, I think this is really important. Uh, and I, I haven't, I actually haven't told, Dave, I'm telling you, you're the first person I'm telling about this, but um, I'm actually putting together a new course uh, on patient perspectives after ACL injury. Uh, and it's going to cover a lot of this stuff. Um, and I have I my lineup all set up. Um, you know, I'm sort of thinking of it like as the softer side of PCL rehab. Uh, and so, but I've already recruited some really great speakers and, um, That's awesome. uh, probably more will come out about this, but, um, but the stuff we just talked about is, is going to be encapsulated. And I think, I think it'll be really well received because I think it is so super important. Uh, but don't Absolutely. tell anyone. Okay, Dave. I'll, be the, I'll be the first one to sign up. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I know yeah. you will. Um, more brain stuff here. So we talk about neuroplastic changes in the brain after injury, but how about the spinal cord? Are there, are there plastic changes there as well? Uh, yeah, so I've kind of talked um, a little bit about this um, up till now where the spinal cord is, is most definitely involved in muscle inhibition, uh, especially right after injury and um, right after surgery. Think of surgery as a secondary insult, it causes another disruption in the, the knee's um, homeostasis. And so spinal level inhibition uh, is the reason that your quadriceps muscle atrophies so quickly, right? It, it, arthrogenic muscle inhibition is, is the reason that this happens. You can inject fluid in somebody's knee and their quadriceps muscle looks like it atrophies kind of right in front of your eyes. And so addressing that in the in the sub or the acute and subacute phases with tens and focal joint cooling um, are really the best treatments that we have. In the long term, um, where kind of it takes a little bit longer, we, we think there's some there's some uh, decent data that shows that the, the brain is spared early on, but over the you know within the first three months changes start to occur. Uh, that this is the reduced excitability of the motor cortex um, and more inhibition. Uh, from a descending perspective, but actually the, the body, the spinal cord seems to compensate for this in the really long term. So like years out, there's a good systematic, two actually systematic reviews um, that look at this and they see that the, the spinal re reflex loop is actually facilitated uh, in the chronic stages for the quadriceps. So um, for whatever reason, maybe because of less descending control, the body kind of adapts by increasing the, the reflexive arc of the quadriceps or the spinal cord driven activation of the quadriceps.
That's great. I'm, <laughs> and I understood most of that. Some of that. Um, this is pretty. This so, is pretty. Um, yeah, heady so, stuff. So address the muscle inhibition at the level of the spinal cord early on. Yeah. Do that with sensory modalities like tens or focal joint cooling. In the yeah. long term, we think that the cortical changes actually drive a compensation at the spinal cord. And so treating the moving towards treatment of the cortical changes with everything that we've talked about, um, including motor imagery and eccentric exercise, anything to increase motor drive can help maybe um, solve the spinal cord changes in the chronic stages. I love it. I love it. I love the practical takeaways. Uh, all right. Well, this is my last question on here. Uh, and it's how do we, how can we leverage our brain's function as a predictor of the environment in the clinic after injury? Uh, and then also how, how does that apply to a healthy athlete trying to avoid injury? Yeah, I think this, this is a good question that kind of, um, goes back to what we're discussing with neurocognition. Uh, and maybe, you know, the example that you gave of distracting a patient from their movement. Um, we're, we're using challenges to the brain through the environment to, uh, you know, recreate the situations that an athlete will have to deal with. Uh, this is neural efficiency, the ability to process many things going on and all at once. Um, for injury prevention, um, there's some data that shows that those with poor neuro neurocognition, so they do worse on things like the, um, oh man, what's that called? uh it'll come to me they do worse on computerized like reaction time tests and impact testing impact testing there you go yeah. they're, they're actually more likely to sustain acl injuries or become injured in sport and um so if that's their baseline then they sustain an acl injury and they're sitting in front of you in the clinic and that hasn't been addressed so incorporating these things into rehab even from the earliest stages uh, will probably be favorable i'm not aware of any um, any like controlled trials that, that test that theory, but, um, from a, from kind of a outside looking in or a common sense perspective, you're, you're challenging the patient, uh, with neurocognitive tasks. They should get better at, at handling that perturbation with time. Um, and you're encouraging more of an external focus of attention. Uh, or a distract a dual task attention, which is which is more um, kind of relevant for sport, right? Nobody in the or on the soccer field very infrequently will an individual be thinking about their body's position. They're going to be thinking about what's emerging mm -hmm. behind them or around them. Okay, well, that's great. Um, do you have any? Uh... Like what, what's one thing I'm going to go to the clinic tomorrow and I want to do better. What is, what's one thing I should think about or what's one, what's it, what's the simple thing that I can, I can start to implement uh, tomorrow. Anyone out there who might be listening and wanting to improve their practice. What would you, what would you recommend? Um, think about the person in front of you. Um, think about what they'll look like in 15 years. Uh, if you don't do your best oh. today and, um, Think about using uh, disinhibitory modalities if there's muscle inhibition present. So if they have a knee joint injury, there's quadriceps inhibition um, within the first three to four months. Use TENS, use focal joint cooling, see if it works, decide for yourself. Yeah. Um, and then don't forget about the complexity of, of care for, from, from you to the person delivering it to the patient who walks in with all of their burdens um, and all of their goals. Um, yeah, things we, I mean, it yeah. goes on forever. You, we haven't talked about, and I didn't write in the blog post anything about nutrition or sleep or mindset and all that stuff is, is equally important. Yeah. <laughs> Has to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're welcome to do a follow-up if you ever, if you ever have time or well, interest, I'm gonna, pass, to... I'm gonna pass the baton, <laughs> thanks though. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Dave, thanks so much for taking time out of your, your evening to talk with me. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you yeah, putting great. in the, the time and effort to, to put together this really great blog post. Uh, I learned yeah, a ton. You. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to yeah. keep reading. I'm probably going to read it at least once more um, just to really try to, to get a grasp on it and try to uh, yeah make some changes. Um, so, and I love it. It's a really awesome kind of like 30,000 foot view look all, all the way down into some really sort of tangible practical applications. I really appreciate you doing that for us. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'd like to thank uh, my wife, Sarah Sherman, and, and you, Matt, <laughs> and Jack Malafrante for proofreading it for me. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, again, all the patients that I've seen in the past uh, for inspiring it. Good, excellent. Well, to anyone out there who's who who made it this far, thanks for watching. Uh, I do uh, want to remind you that this is a series, and so uh, we're have we're on a really good roll here. So uh, tomorrow, Jason Avedesian's blog is going to come out, and then in a couple of weeks, we're going to sit down with him uh, and talk, uh, and then after that, it'll be. Uh, four more. So we're going to keep this going for a little while. So um, it's been really fun for me. So hopefully it's been good for, 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 for those of you out there. So, all right, Dave, have a yeah. good rest Great. of your week. Thanks, Matt. All right. Bye, Bye. now.